Hey guys, Manic McCurian here, back once again. In this video, I'm just going to answer a common question, which is, how do I read charts? How do I read birth charts? Um, I think it's very common for people to see a chart such as this and to be overwhelmed. There's so much stuff there, and to hear a person such as myself reading a chart like this, I'm, you know, getting so much information from, from this little picture, and I think it can be overwhelming. Um, and very complicated but the nice thing about the astrology is that although it is complex it's based on very simple patterns and once you understand those simple patterns reading a chart is actually pretty easy to do um so basically what it comes down to what reading a chart comes down to and astrology in general is four things signs planets houses and aspects once you have a firm understanding of those four things, you will be able to read charts and to, you know, do your, come up with your own interpretations. Um, and so here, I just want to talk about, you know, the very basics of those four things and also talk about the orientation of a chart and, you know, what, what actually is a chart? What is this representing um, specifically? And just, you know, help to explain the basic fundamentals of the chart itself. Um, so a chart such as this, this is just a random chart I did. I just thought this chart would be easy to interpret. I'm not sure if I'll interpret it in this video, but this is just for Sunday, August 9th, 2020 at 7.30 a.m. in Dallas, Texas. And uh, so this is actually a representation of the sky at, at that particular time and place. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start with the Ascendant. Everything starts with your Ascendant. You, uh, some people may know, most people know their Sun sign. Some people know their Sun, Moon, and Rising. Uh, but when they say Rising or Ascendant, Rising and Ascendant are the same thing. Also, First House Cusp is the same thing. But what they're talking about is this right here, AC, this black arrow right here. And that represents the Eastern Horizon. Um, so not only the sun, but also the moon and all the planets rise from the eastern horizon. And this glyph right here actually meet, stands for the sun. So here you can see the sun had just risen above the eastern horizon. So it was morning, um, it was dawn, and that makes sense. You know, we can look at the time and see that it's 7.30 a.m. In, in summer in Texas. So yeah, it makes sense the sun is rising. Um, but you can see that represented here. All Generally, most of these... Uh, Almost all of these symbols, we call them glyphs, on the outside of the wheel are planets. Um, like I said, this isn't a planet. This AC stands for the Ascendant or you know Eastern Horizon. Also, MC stands for the top of the sky or the top of the ecliptic. Ecliptic is the path w through which all the sun and planets tra travel or appear to travel from our perception, our perspective. Um, but the rest, most of the rest of these, especially all the, these colored ones, those are planets. And, um, uh, let's just go through them real quick. So the easiest ones to understand are the sun and the moon. This is the sun. This orange ball is the orange circle is the sun. That is pretty intuitive to most people. Um, and this yellow one is the moon. Again, that makes sense. It's shaped like a crescent. Also, Venus and Mars are pretty easy to understand. Venus is like the classic sign or glyph for femininity, um, which does pertain a lot to what Venus is all about. It's the it's a planet of femininity, among other things. Mars, too, it represents masculinity, among, among other things. Um, it's very masculine-oriented, and so the glyph is the classic symbol for you know male or masculine. Um, and then going up from there, the rest of them are usually not as intuitive to people um, this purple one is Mercury. It almost looks like a Venus with horns on it. Um, but that's Mercury. Neptune is the Triton with, you know, the three points. Like, uh, if you have an understanding of the Greek gods or the Roman gods, um, there are a lot of parallels to these planets. So, you know, Poseidon, Neptune in Poseidon in Greek, Neptune in Roman, um, Roman culture, I guess, or Roman mythology had a triton and so it makes sense neptune is the triton um saturn is this cross with a little squiggle coming off of it pluto is this little ball it's almost like a ball and a cup holder type of thing and then jupiter is this uh turquoise almost like a fancy number four <clears throat> but yeah so we've got planets on the outside and then these are signs on the inside um 
real quick, so for this person, we'd start with the Ascendant, which is in Leo. Ascendant is always on the left side. Eastern Horizon is always on the left side. We start with Leo, and then there's Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and Cancer. Always in that order, although we may start in different places for different charts. Um, in general, in astrology, we usually start with Aries, just because that's the start of spring. But when we're reading a you know, a, a personal chart, we start with wherever the Eastern horizon was. So in this case, Leo, um, yeah. So signs on the inside plants on the outside, generally speaking. And I touched on the Eastern horizon being here. So you can, you might be able to guess the Western horizon is directly opposite that. So it's this black arrow over here. It's not labeled. Um, but it is this black arrow here and that would be called the descendant or also could be called the seventh house cusp. Um, and then, and there's four of these black arrows total. So Eastern horizon, Western horizon. Um, and then there's the top of the sky called the mid Evan or, or the top of the ecliptic. And those two, those are two different things. So the, technically the mid Evan is the top of the ecliptic. If you're near the tropical latitudes, um, the mid Evan will be basically directly above at all times. But if you're in the Northern extreme Northern latitudes or extreme Southern, but that'd be really rare. I haven't read anyone's chart who's from the very southern latitudes but but if you're like me i was born in alaska so um the top of the ecliptic may actually be very low and may not be at the top of the sky but generally speaking um the mid heaven or the top of the ecliptic it's always near the top of the chart generally speaking um, and then directly opposite that will always be the ic again it's not labeled but it's called the ic it stands for imam coeli i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right but um you don't really need to know that it uh it's basically just the base of the chart. Again, it's directly opposite the top. So it's, um, it's like the underworld. Um, these, the Eastern and Western horizon, of course, are like the, you know, they're the horizon. So they're the line, they, um, the line that divides the above ground from the underground. So everything above this line, if you want to think about it that way, I'm on paint. So I guess I could just draw a line here. <coughs> So everything above this line I just drew is was the visible sky at this time and place. So, you know, all these planets, it was daytime, obviously, but if it wasn't, uh, if it was nighttime, then these planets would be visible. The moon would be visible. So it was, you know, definitely very visible in the sky. Um, and then all the planets below this line were underground, or at least from our perception, they would appear to be, you know, they're under the horizon they had already set. And, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. What else? You can also get into houses. I'm not going to get super deep into any of these concepts. If you want me to explain further on any of these concepts, I'd be happy to um, make a video just about, you know, any one of these particular topics. Um, okay, so let's get into these four basic things. So I already explained signs. <clears throat> signs on the inside. So what are signs? Signs are based on constellations they don't uh, if you're using western astrology which is the common you know type of astrology most americans or you know people in western society uh would typically use we our our, our zodiac signs don't exactly match up with the constellations they represent and that's a technicality if you're just starting you don't have to worry about that um we can get into that later but they are based on constellations so they basically represent the backdrop the the stars you know the stars which appear to never move um you know the planets move these the ancients called the planets the moving stars because they look like stars but they gradually move of course from our perception but the the fixed stars the constellations appear to never move they're so far away they are moving but they're so so far away they they are you know the backdrop um if this were compared to a board game it would it'll almost be like the zodiac signs or the constellations are the board of the board game and then the planets on the outside would be the the playing pieces which are you know moving around on on, on the backdrop if that makes sense um yeah and then and then i branched out so with understanding the signs you you should get into uh elements modes and polarities um like for this chart for instance 
we can see like there's sun and leo moon and aries and you'll start to notice patterns like that so like leo and aries are both fire signs also the ascendant isn't a fire sign so we can see right away okay fire is a major theme for this chart for this person uh mercury in a fire sign mars in a fire sign you know this is a very fiery chart so it's all about seeing patterns like that um but what are elements so there's four elements that are typically they would be in this order fire earth air water um at least in astrology for other you know for chinese astrology they have like five elements for other schools of thought there, there may be more elements here there's four elements fire earth air water um and if we start with the spring equinox in aries aries is fire taurus is earth gemini is air cancer is water and then it repeats leo's fire virgo's earth etc um and that repeats for three cycles um you know aries begins one cycle of that if you want to think about it that way then leo and then sagittarius so there's three signs for each elements three signs times four elements equals 12 signs total okay um so again just in, in other words there's three fire signs three earth signs three air signs three water signs and each sign signs that share elements are similar so elements are it's just a way to group or classify the signs in a way um fire signs again i'm not gonna get super deep into this but just real quick fire signs are outgoing they are leaders they begin things they're impulsive they're spontaneous they're energetic they're excitable they can be very happy but they can also get frustrated or angered easily um they're just they're the most active the most energetic um earth is more stable it's more fixed and orderly it's more introverted um more grounded i guess there's a lot of words you know like for fire there's like hot-headed or or just fiery, you know, we might say someone's very fiery. With earth, someone might say you're very grounded or, you know, you've got your feet on the ground type of thing. Um, what else? Earth, we could think of as being cool and, you know, kind of calming. So, you know, earth people are de definitely usually more cool, more calm. If Mercury's in an earth sign, usually they're a little bit monotone or they have a bassy voice like for me for instance i have my mercury in an earth sign i'm very earthy if that helps you at all um and then there's air which is much more active again a little bit like fire but more rational fire is very emotional air is very logical it could be very quirky very different very eccentric um very talkative very chatty sociable air is all about ideas and people um thoughts words concepts what else you know someone might be described as airheaded or um you know they are got their head in the clouds or something i don't know something like that you know where air signs can be very smart they can be very scientific very analytical but they can also be kind of ditzy or scattered um you know in a way and so that's where you get some of these archetypes. And then water, lastly, is the most emotional, the most spiritual, the most intuitive. Um, it's often misunderstood just because it's so emotional. I think just because of our society, we don't aren't oriented that way. But um, and water, intuitive, empathic, um, passionate. It's passionate like fire and emotional like fire, but it's more cool, more introverted like earth, if that makes sense okay so four elements and then you also have three modes so four elements fire earth air water three modes cardinal fixed mutable um and that this kind of correlates to the season so if we again if we start with aries we always start with aries um aries starts spring so each sign that happens at the beginning of a season this is all in relation to the sun but it's a good understanding it's a good basis for understanding these types of things so if we start with aries it's cardinal um because it initiates a season it's the first sign of spring the first sign after the spring equinox so um the four signs that begin after equinoxes or solstices are always cardinal so aries begins spring um cancer begins summer libra begins fall and capricorn begins winter and so you'll have four signs for each mode there's three modes four signs for each of those 
3 times 4 makes 12. And when you combine the elements and the modes, it also makes 12. So 4 elements, 3 modes. Um, so there's one sign for each combination since, again, there's 12 signs. So Aries is the one and only cardinal fire sign. So you'll have, um, you know, cardinal fire. Leo is fixed fire and Sagittarius is mutable fire. Um, so, you know, that's the same with all the elements. And so the, just understanding that gives you a, a really rich understanding of the signs because again each sign can be understood in that context um after aries you have taurus which is fixed earth and then gemini which is mutable air and um going into the modes a little bit more so cardinal begins the season it's all you know they're leaders in some way although with some it's a little bit more subtle but even cancer and libra are leaders just maybe not in a conventional sense um I can get into that more of that later, but they are leaders in some way. They are about asserting their individuality in some way, um, leading in some way, initiating in some way. Fixed signs are about stability, so they're the middle of the seasons where, of course, weather is different in different latitudes and stuff like that, but generally, depending on where you are, the weather stabilizes, the season stabilizes during the fixed signs. So um, unless it's spring or fall, which those seasons um, by definition are focused on change. And so, um, they can be a little bit more, um, unstable, but generally speaking, the fixed signs are the most stable times of the year where, you know, the season is very much in full effect. It, it, you know, it's been a while since the season started and it will be a while before it ends. We're just experiencing the, the, the most stable part of it. Um, so those signs are usually more stubborn, more consistent, you know, they're more oriented towards stability and consistency. And then you have mutable, which occurs at the ending of all four seasons. Um, so for spring, the third sign and the first mutable sign is Gemini and Gemini is the, the last part of spring. So it's, it represents endings and, um, Mutable signs represent change and openness because at the last third of the season, it's kind of switching back and forth between that season and the next. So in Gemini, it might seem like spring, it might seem like summer. You know, Gemini is very, it's it's there and it's here. It's kind of everywhere. It's very open-minded. It understands different things. You know, it's all about um, variety, I guess. And um, it's very eclectic if you want to think about it that way. You know, and that just pertains to the, it's the transition between one season to the next. And then by the time you get to the next cardinal sign, it's fully, you know, we're fully going into the next season. So uh, Cancer is very much, is the fourth sign, the second water sign. I mean, sorry, the first water sign. And it's very much beginning summer um, and introducing its own themes. And then, so, and then 1C, I guess, is the way I put it, would be polarities. And there's different ways that, that astrologers talk about this, whether you want to call it yin-yang. I usually say yin-yang. I, I, I like that. I think it's the most accurate. But some people will say masculine or feminine or um, maybe dominant or submissive or outgoing or introverted kind of works too. Um, but basically, there's two polarities or two, you know, yin-yang, you know, like I just said. Um, and... Basically what it is, is uh, fire and air are more active. So they are both yang or masculine or dominant or outgoing or what, what have you, depending on how you say it. I would say yin yang. So yang is more dominant. It's more expressive. It's more outgoing. Uh, yang is day. Yin is night. Yang is male. Yin is female, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Um, so yeah, fire and air are yang. So they're less careful. They're more just about, you know, let's just get out and do something. Let's be impulsive. Let's be spontaneous. Let's just make s stuff happen. Let's stir, stir the pot. Um, you know, fire and air are usually the talkers. They're the extroverts. Typically speaking, of course, it, um, it depends on your chart, but generally speaking, they are more outgoing, uh, more spontaneous, more sporadic. And then likewise, the on the other side, you have earth and water, which are yin or feminine or submissive or introverted, and they are less active, at least on the outside. M more of their activity is in their mind or, you know, in their heart, I guess. They're either thinking or feeling more. 
Um, they're more sensitive, more careful. They like to plan before they act, you know, so that's why they may seem less active. They're not as, I don't know, just spontaneous or sporadic or, um, they're just more careful and more thoughtful with their actions, you know? So it's kind of two different approaches and neither one is right or wrong. It's just two different expressions of consciousness. Um, so you could compare it to, like, I think I touched on day would be yang. You can see these in all parts of life, really, not just in astrology. Like, for example, like, um, male and female is one, one part of this, but, um, it would be likening male and female to day and night. A day isn't necessarily male, but day and male share commonalities where there are traditionally thought of as you know it'd be more expressive or more active um female or night or yin you know those are all more subtle or there's more more activity that's covert or just internal or um you know like with nighttime it's generally a period of inactivity or it could be a time of secrecy as well um males are usually thought to be as more overt or more direct and females maybe more subtle if that makes sense so um so that's just what i'm saying when when i'm talking about these polarities and so understanding um the signs that way will help too because again th this these things are basically setting you up to recognize patterns so here um like i said this chart is very fiery we've got leo and aries uh the, you know that's where the main focus is there's also these three planets in capricorn those are outer planets, so they're not as, you know, particular for this person. Um, but overall, I'd say there's definitely this focus in Aries in uh, Aries and Leo. And those are both Yang expressions. Um, there's actually no other plants in any other Yang signs, though. Gemini, Libra, Sagittarius, you know, the fire and the air signs. Um, but still, generally, that's enough where there's more of a focus on Yang. So more expressive, more outgoing, um, that sort of thing. So that, So that's just one example of... Um, something to set you up to help you recognize patterns. Um, two is planets. So like I said, you know, the planets are all represented in a chart by these glyphs on the outside. Um, getting to know, like if you have, again, if you have any understanding of um, astronomy or if you, if in school they taught you the order of the planets, that would help you a lot here. Um, there's a few subjects like either astronomy or mythology that tie into astrology. Um, that could help you getting into it. But, uh, yeah. And so, in order, um, the planets going from the sun outward. We don't include Earth in astrology just because we're perceiving things from Earth. So, we don't have Earth in a chart. Usually, you can use Earth, but that's a separate thing. I wouldn't even worry about that. Just getting into it, into things. But, in order, the planets would be the sun, then uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And we also use the moon. Um, sometimes we order these in in order from fastest to slowest, at least in terms of how we perceive them. So that would be pretty much the same, but with the moon leading. So moon, sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And, okay. And, uh, yeah, and each planet ha it, each planet pertains to different parts of our personality, different parts of life. Each planet sort of has a character of its own. Um, I mean, once you get to know the signs, it's almost like each sign is sort of a personality within itself. But the planets, too, each have a sort of personality within itself. And depending on where, where they are, you know, in relation to the, the zodiac signs, they express themselves in different ways. And that's basically um, what we're looking at when we're looking at a chart. So, for instance, in this chart, the sun is in Leo. Um, the sun rules Leo. So, Leo is like the home of the sun, in a way. It's said to be, you know, it's the sign which most correlates to the sun. And that makes sense. You know, it's the middle of summer. So, that's kind of like the peak time for the sun's power. The sun is very strong then. We can experience that very literally. Um you know, but but like like that, um, each planet has a different relation to to each sign. Um, the ancients would call the signs like houses in a way, which can be confusing because now houses means sort of a different thing. But um, the signs were sort of seen as like houses 
or you could think of them as like neighborhoods for each planet um e each planet had a sign which was its home it also had a sign of exaltation which is its like vacation home i think i got that from leo king um, but i really like that it does make a lot of sense and then opposing the sign of domicile or the home sign is the sign of detriment so it's like where the planet is farthest away from home it, it's out of place it doesn't uh, manifest very well there's challenges there it's sort of an outcasted or exiled placement so for instance if this chart had sun in aquarius all the way opposite leo um, aquarius that would be the middle of winter so you know aquarius represents the middle of winter the sun is at its low point then it's at its weakest then um so aquarius sun signs do sometimes have trouble you know with their ego ego is represented by the sun so um that being in sort of a difficult place you know they do have a hard time understanding where do they fit in what what is their personality all about how do they express themselves um you know it can be somewhat of a challenge but again it's and and they're an outcast so um that does have benefits as well as challenges i mean it was more of a challenging placement but the benefit of a detriment placement would be you know seeing things from a, a different perspective or an alternative pers alternative perspective um something like that um see in this chart you you've also got mars and i don't want to delve into the reading a chart mars is in aries though so again mars is in um it's almost all there so so these planets would be very strong and they sort of dominate the personality when they're in signs that they feel comfortable in if you want to sort of imagine it that way um yes okay and then and i would just suggest sort of sort of similar to understanding the signs um you know with the signs you probably understand just get to know them one by one almost like you're getting to know a person in a way um, planets, learning the planets is similar. Like I said, each planet has a personality of sorts. And so you can just get to know each one, one by one. Like, um, the sun, I could do a video series on this too, but like the sun obviously is very dominant. It's very expressive. Like, you know, when the sun's there or not, it is radiant. And so, um, it's the part of our personality that we bring to the world. It's, it's who we are during the daytime. You know, it's who we are at work and with friends. It's how we represent ourselves in the world. It's our ego. Um, and it makes sense. The sun is, you know, it very much shows us how to represent your, yourself in the world, how to be very consistent. The sun is consistent, um, stuff like that. So it's almost, it's very metaphorical in a way. And, um, each point has a meaning and, I can actually see astronomically, you know, reasoning why each planet has that type of meaning. There, there are little things which make sense. So, for example, like Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system, and it's the planet of abundance. It like blows everything up and um, brings just wealth and prosperity and good gifts. And it's also about big ideas, big philosophy. So it makes sense that you know it's the biggest planet, represents abundance and big ideas you know, is that a coincidence? I think not. Um, and likewise, you know, you, you'll start to see patterns like that for each planet and, and for the moon and, and sun. Um, okay. And then once you understand that some people learn houses before planets, I learned planets before houses. I learned everything basically in this order that I am showing here. And that's what I would suggest for you as well. Um, if you have another way of doing it, go crazy. Like if you, are passionate about learning aspects or houses first, then do that. You know, I'm not, I'm not your mom. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying this is what worked for me. And, uh, this is how I, I would suggest doing it. Um, but houses to me are a little trickier. I mean, signs and planets are pretty easy to learn. I, I had trouble with the houses for a while. Um, but the houses are similar to the signs in the sense that they are a sort of backdrop for the planets here so the houses are represented by these little numbers on the outside of the chart so it's this you know little area just outside of the signs and they are depending on what house system you're using they're dependent on these angles the four angles represented by these you know black arrows on the outside um, so for instance, we always have, um, first house typically starts with the ascendant. Um, again, it kind of depends on what house system you're using. I can talk more about different house systems in another video if you'd like. 
Um, but most of us use Plasis. I actually use Equal, which is, is slightly different. But if you're a beginner, you don't you don't need to know the difference yet. Um, but generally speaking, you've got the first house, which starts with the Ascendant, and it always goes down, so counterclockwise, away from the Ascendant. First house, second house, third house, fourth house, all the way up. And um, the IC, or the bottom of the chart, is typically the beginning of the fourth house. Four, five, six, and then... There's three houses in each quadrant. So just like there's three signs in each season, there's three houses in each quadrant. Um, so in the first quadrant, which is which starts with the Ascendant, there's uh, houses one, two, three. After the IC, which starts the, the second quadrant, you've got houses four, five, and six. After the Descendant, which starts the third quadrant, you've got houses seven, eight, and nine. And then after the mid Evan or the 10th house cusp, which starts the fourth quadrant, you have houses 10, 11, 12. And we talk about house cusps. So ascendant is first house cusp, second house cusp, third house cusp is here. IC is also called the fourth house cusp, et cetera, et cetera. Descendant is also called the seventh house cusp, seventh house cusp, and so on. And um, the houses, like I said, are in relation to the horizons, and so they do change very quickly. To know the um, ascendant and the houses in general, you need to know the person's time and place of birth. And so it might not be as readily available to you, but it does give you a lot of information on the chart. Um, knowing it gives you, it's like the context sort of. So similar to how the signs provide a lot of context, um, the houses provide another layer of context in a way. So for example, um, in this chart, the sun is in the 12th house and the 12th house is obscure. It's not, it's almost like behind the ascendant in a way, even though the sun just had, just, had just risen. Um, the 12th house is seen as not being visible from the ascendant. So it's, it's obscure. Um, you've also got these planets in the eighth house. Eighth house is similar to 12th house, just like Scorpio is the eighth sign and Pisces is the 12th sign. And they're both kind of obscure and they both have a lot in common because they're water. The 12th and the eighth houses also have a lot in common. Um, there is a, a theory of houses equal signs, which is not totally accurate. There are some connections for sure, but, um, know that the houses are not the same as the signs. So Yes, the first house does have to do with self, and Aries has to do with self, and Aries is the first sign, so there are some connections there. Um, but there's also a lot of different things. So learn about the houses separate from the signs is what I would suggest. Um, but you can notice patterns. So like 8th and 12th houses are both hidden or obscure, and that's where the sun and the moon are. Um, so although being in fire signs, being very outgoing, knowing the houses adds another layer so it's like okay well this person's outgoing but they might be outgoing in maybe subtle or unconventional ways or they might um might be hard for them to gain self-awareness or there's part of them that's that's obscure or not obvious if that makes sense so that adds a very different layer to this fiery chart and um in general the houses they all represent a different part of our lives or a different part of our personality first house is self second house is like belongings or finances third house is communications siblings neighbors cousins i guess or um maybe friends to some extent um acquaintances f um f also okay let me fourth house is uh home and family and in general so the ascendant starts the ascendant is all about the self and so the first quadrant is pretty much all about the self um specifically the first house but also second house is like the, um, what, what are your belongings or what are your finances? It's all stuff that supports the self. The second house, um, supports the first and then the third house falls away from it. So the third house is still much about self and individuality, but it's branching out into the next, um, house in a way. So it's branching out into, it, it is about self, but it's also about, you know, re relating to others, other um, people, neighbors, friends, stuff like that. And then that brings us to the second quadrant, which is all about home and family, started off by the IC, which is all about home and family. Uh, fourth house is home and family, you know, parents, upbringing, stuff like that. Fifth house is 
we'll say fun and games, um, children, creation. It does have a lot to do with family as well, but it's more about pride, um, pride for yourself, pride for your family, pride for whatever you've created, whether it's a child or a painting or something you created for work. Um, it's an extension of yourself, and that's what the fifth house is all about. It's about um, creation and, and pride, and it's a place for having fun in a way. Um, and then sixth house is the ancients would say it's like a cursed house. It's one of the most difficult houses. It's about health and work. It's also it's also about like problem solving. It's a lot. Of, there's a lot of just daily life problems there. Um, it does make sense. Six house correlates to Virgo, and Virgo is kind of focused on you know problem solving or focused on health and health issues, stuff like that. And then that brings us to the Descendant, which is all about Descendant opposes the Ascendant. So Ascendant is about self, uh, personal identity. Descendant is all about other. So how do we relate to the world? How do we relate to other people? What what do we need and expect in a, in a one on one relationship with another person? those types of things, you know, partnerships. And that starts the seventh house, which is all about partnerships, one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, definitely romantic relationships, but also, you know, any kind of partnership, any kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship, like a business partnership. Um, if you have a best friend you do everything with or a twin or something, you know, it'd be that person, that one-on-one -on -one relationship and how you relate to them, what your needs are in those areas. Eighth house is... Um, it was called the house of like inactivity or something like that. So it's a inactive house and it's more obscure and it's something that astrologers fight about what it means exactly. Um, it opposes the second house. Second house is your personal finances. So usually eighth house has to do with other people's finances. How do you, it's uh, shared resources. So like um, money that you owe someone, money that someone owes you, um, you know, taxes would be here. It's, it's uh, shared resources and debts, inheritances, stuff like that. Um, ninth house in ancient times was called the house of the church, house of religion. Um, it could be ideas and belief systems. And it's also getting close to the mid heaven. So it has to do with represent, representing yourself in the world. Um, and that leads us to mid heaven. Mid heaven is your career. It's your public image. You know, it's the most visible part of the chart. So it makes sense that it, it's how you represent yourself in the world. It's, um, your career, your your work, I guess. Um, also, I think it's your life path. If life is a story, it's sort of the structure of your life story. And that's just my own personal theory. Um, and I can get more into that later. And so, and that begins the 10th house. It also begins the 4th quadrant. So the 4th quadrant is more about the world. And as you can see, they get more expansive as you got. So it starts with self, then it branches into family, then it branches into like relationships um and then it branches into just the world at large and then it ultimately brings us back to self so starting with the 10th house it's career public image you know who you are in the world your um public profile stuff like that 11th house is your aspirations your future your goals um it also has to a lot a lot to do with society and you know community so um so one once it's almost like it paints a story or paints a picture of a story so 10th house is your career, which, which leads you to your goals. And I think our goals and our future plans sort of incline us to, they typically involve working with others. So you have to find other people would share your same dream, your same goal. And that would be represented by the 11th house, um, goals, which is who you associate with, um, clubs, community, stuff like that. And then that brings us to 12th house, which is the most obscure. Um, 12th house is the final house. So it ends the whole cycle. It's very much about endings. It could be about loss. It's one of the most difficult houses. It's obscure and hard to understand. It's things that are non-physical in nature. It's our subconscious. It's uh, spirituality or metaphysics. Um, things like that. Okay, and lastly would be aspects. So, are also called angles. I could have called this angles. So each planet has an angle with one another. Um, so for instance, the one part of this image which I didn't really define or talk about was these lines in the middle. And these, so these lines in the middle are representing aspects or angles. Um, so for instance, 
like if a planet makes a right angle or a 90 degree angle it will be a sort of contentious relationship because they are in disagreement here so and you can learn about this through the signs too so each sign has an aspect or an angle with every other sign so for instance leo and aries are both fire signs um and they both they try in one another so it's a harmonious aspect it's a 120 degree aspect or thereabouts um and all all signs within one element will try in one another so all three fire signs here are trining and so all three make an equilateral triangle compared to one another um, and that's true for any element so Taurus, Virgo, Capricorn all make an equilateral triangle. If you look at the modes, they all square one another. So they're all 90 degrees apart from one another. So here, um, Leo makes is directly opposite Aquarius, and then Taurus and Scorpio are directly opposite as well. And so it makes a cross. You know, each one is 90 degrees apart from the next one. And um, and basically, the major aspects are trine square I, t I just talked about those opposition which is probably the easiest under to understand 180 degrees directly opposite one another and then there's also sextile which is a sign that's two signs away from another sign or 60 degrees um and then there's conjunction which is you know when two planets are at the same exact position or close to the same exact position they're called conjunct or married like for instance let's see if we can find a conjunction here so moon and mars are pretty much conjunct it says here moon is 23 degrees mars is 21 degrees they're both in aries so we would say they're conjunct with an orb of two degrees meaning you know they're they're two degrees away from being exactly conjunct or exactly on the same degree um yeah and and each aspect describes a different relationship sort of and um we can understand this best by looking at the moon cycle that gives us a very visible picture so the moon starts out conjunct the sun um you can't see it yet but it is a beginning so things are in the works the seeds are being planted um it's the beginning of a new cycle and then as the moon you know day by day it begins to separate from the sun um you'll see a crescent and so then it'll begin to sextile once it sextiles then it's a harmonious um relationship and there's it's a very much a beginning there's light showing on the moon so there's um something blossoming then you've got the moon making its first square to the sun so it's the first quarter moon where the moon is half lit up and it is a time of contention of anxiety and restlessness time of activity and starting something new then you've got the moon making its first trine to the sun so it's more harmonious again and in in general with astrology you'll see this pattern where it's harmonious and then it's contentious harmonious contentious um you know sextile is harmonious square is contentious trine is harmonious after the trine you've got the first opposition which is more contentious um it's the full moon so a time of culmination a time of activity and restlessness again sort of like the first square after that you've got basically all the same aspects except in descending order so then, then you've got the second trine then the um second square i guess or the third quarter moon and then the sextile and then conjunction again and then that starts a new cycle um and again i can get way more into all this in another video if you'd like but that's just the basics of those are just all the aspects that the moon makes with the sun through a lunar cycle and there are more like smaller minor aspects which i don't really get into um but those are the main ones uh, um, just again conjunction sextile trine square and opposition there's also quincunx which i sometimes get into quincunx is 150 degrees so for instance um the way i would think about it is it's so if we're looking at leo here the signs that quincunx leo would be not directly opposite because that would be an opposition with aquarius but the signs next to the opposing sign so capricorn and pisces form quincunxes to leo let me just go through all all of these uh aspects so let's just use leo since this is sun and rising in leo um so a planet that's i mean signs can't be conjunct themselves but i guess leo would be conjunct itself it just you know is itself in a way um and then 
signs next to this sign would be called um, semi-sextile, which again is a very minor aspect not everyone gets into. It's not a major aspect. You don't even really need to know that. Um, but the major ones are sextile, so that's two signs away. So Libra and Gemini form a sextile to Leo. And you can notice patterns. So like Leo is a fire sign. Both signs that sextile are air. So, um, and that's how it always is where the sextiling signs will be of the same polarity. So they're both yang, just like Leo is yang, but it's the other element within the same polarity. So Leo's fire, um, both signs that sextile are air. Libra and Gemini are air. Um, you could look at like Cancer, Cancer's water, both signs that sextile are Virgo and, and Taurus. So they're all three of them are yin, but um, Virgo and Taurus are earth, Cancer is water. Um, anyway, so starting going back to Leo, um, the third sign away would be fi um, a fellow fixed sign, and that would form a square aspect. So Scorpio and Taurus are both three signs away from Leo. They both make squares to Leo. Um, so it can be contentious. They do have the mode in common. Um, you always get the modes in common when you have fixed signs or, uh, I mean, squaring signs. Um, but they're fixed in a different way. They're always going to be different elements to one another. So they are all fixed in this example, but, you know, one's earth, one's fire, one's water. So they're fundamentally different. After that, you've got Sagittarius is trining and same with um, Aries. Both are four signs away from Leo and um, they're all trining and they'll always be the same element. Like I said, trining signs to one another will always be the same element. You can have out of sign trines, but that's a technicality. I could explain more about that later. Uh, but in general, just looking at the signs themselves, trying the signs that they make trines to will always be the same element. So there's a harmoniousness there. there. It's easy because they have the element in common. So they've got a lot in common with one another. So it's easy for them to, it's easy for those understand uh, for those energies to assimilate. Um, after that, like I said, five signs away, you've got the quincunx, and then six signs away, you've got the opposition, directly opposite. Um, opposites could be, it could be opposites attract, they can balance one another. There could be sort of a push and pull, like magnets, um, they do attract each other, but they're very different, so it can be also hard for them to understand one another. And yeah, I'm sure this video is getting long enough, so hopefully that gives you just a little bit of understanding. Um, I could explain way more about each of these things, so if you have any questions whatsoever, um, I could get into more things. I do suggest you can you can look at these things one by one. So in your chart, you know, just start out with like Sun and Leo. You know, what is that? Rising and Leo. What is that? Sorry, my AC just kicked on. <laughs> um, Moon and Aries. What is that? Mars and Aries. You know, that's very common. Go through it one by one. That's fine. Um, it will give you the basics in order to put the picture together later. Um, but don't expect yourself to fully read a chart right away. You, you got to understand all these little basic things first and um, just kind of get immersed in those smaller things first. So hopefully that helps. Let me know any questions that you have whatsoever or anything I didn't clarify. I'll either comment back or I can make a video about it. And at any rate, thanks for watching and I'll see you later.